All right, everyone, um, we are getting started now. Um, it looks like folks who are joining a moment or two late, it's all started to slow down. So hopefully folks are here if they're looking to be here. Uh, my name is Cece, I'm with the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Um, and I'm joined by Jared Rhodes and most of the rest of our small team here today for our webinar on the 1918 flu pandemic and Calvin Coolidge. Um, we hope today's call is going to be a useful resource for you to learn about the past and to contextualize the current situation in which we find ourselves today. Um, this is our second virtual event and we're glad to have you be joining us. Um, at the foundation, we've undertaken to build out many more um, digital resources um, right now. Um, we're building a digital library, which is very exciting. Some of you might know that um, Calvin Coolidge is one of the, is the most recent president not to have a government funded library. Um, and he would likely smile upon that fact. He wouldn't have wanted government funds going towards something to promote his own legacy. Um, in his autobiography, which we're about to republish, he said that he didn't think past presidents should be supported at all by taxpayers. Um, so our library for Calvin Coolidge will be virtual. It'll be supported by private donors and volunteers who are going to edit uh, documents for us to prepare them for online publication. Um, and I invite all of you to join us in that effort um, as a donor or as a volunteer. Um, if you'd like to do that as a volunteer, no experience is necessary and we welcome any and all help. So please send me an email if you are interested in doing that. Um, we have several audience members with us today who are already volunteering as Coolidge Scribes, which is what we're calling our digital volunteers. So I wanna say a special thank you to them. I also want to extend a special welcome to readers of the Boston Globe who have joined us after reading the article published in that uh, paper over the weekend. Um, it's exciting to know that print journalism is alive and well for those of you who have joined us that way. Um, as one final housekeeping announcement, we will be having our third digital event uh, this coming Thursday, so just later this week. Um, for that, we will have Coolidge Foundation Chairman and best-selling author Amity Schles um, giving a talk at noon titled, Did Coolidge Cause the Great Depression? Um, which is sure to be a very exciting conversation, and we hope that you all will join us for that. Um, so email me for that just as you did for this call today, and I'll get you the information to participate. Um, now, I know that you're all here not to hear me, but to hear our my colleague, Jared Rhodes, talk about Coolidge and the 1918 flu outbreak. He'll be talking for a few minutes, and then he'll be answering questions. Um, and I can't think of anyone better than our Coolidge debate director and our in-house policy expert, Jared Rhodes, to be helping out with this conversation today. Um, he'll explain maybe his background a little bit and why he's so well positioned to, uh, to give us this information. Um, he's going to speak for a few minutes and then he'll be taking questions. Um, we'd like you to keep your question to length of about a minute and Jared's responses will be brief also so that we can get to as many as possible. Um, logistically for answering or for asking questions about that, um, please send me a message over Zoom if you're on a computer. Um, you can send me a message directly and that'll signal to me that you'd like to be added to the question queue. Um, and if you're joining by phone, please reply to the email that you sent me in order to get the information to log in. And I will uh, gather your question that way and get it to Jared. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jared Rhodes. Oh, as soon as he is unmuted. There he is. Thank you very much. Okay, can you can everybody hear me now? Uh, great. Great. Yeah, I uh, unmuted myself there. Okay, um, so thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. I'm excited to be here uh, talking about this, this topic. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the debate director here at the Coolidge Foundation. I'm also a health policy instructor uh, outside of here. Um, and so, hey, when, when you know, topics come together and, um, uh, and I can do, uh, do, do both, that's, that's extra exciting. Um, let's go to the, the first slide um, about today's talk, sort of laying out uh, the, the agenda for the day. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with the, an overview of the, uh, of the sort of the size and the scope of the 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic. 
Um, and then what I'll do is, is go chronologically through the three waves. Um, this was a three wave uh, pandemic. Um, and I think uh, the first wave is important to understand because it tells us how things got started in, in some sense, you know, uh, how they could possibly happen again. Um, so we'll spend a little bit of time there on that first wave. Um, Coolidge features most prominently in the second wave. Uh, so we'll, we'll also spend some time there. Um, when we talk about the second wave, uh, we'll, we'll do it with a certain Massachusetts and Boston focus. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about the third wave, uh, but that'll be the, the, the briefest. Um, I'll also touch on some things that sort of uh, fit under the, the general theme of aftermath, uh, including, um, you know, like what happened after the, or as the third wave was winding down and, and after the third wave um, there in, in 1919, including the lead up to the Boston police strike, which was another notable Coolidge event. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on that a, a little bit as well. And then um, we'll wrap up with uh, some takeaways. Okay, so next slide. Great, okay, overview. Um, so I'm gonna assume that with, with everything that's happening in the world uh, right now, you, you're probably all pretty motivated to learn about this topic. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of preliminaries, but I, I do wanna orient you to the sort of scale uh, and enormity of the event. Um, the 1918-1919 pandemic was arguably the worst pandemic in, in human history. Um, worldwide, approximately 500 million people were infected by uh, influenza. Um, that was one third of the world's population. Um, and roughly 50 million of those people died. Um, these numbers are, are definitely uncertain, uh, and there are there's certainly some quite large ranges actually that are given in the literature, uh, but these are some of the, the most commonly cited figures. Um, in case you're wondering about my, my qualification of you know, arguably the worst pandemic, um, I just wanna point out that the Black Death, which you might've been worried, you know, wondering about, um, which is the, the bubonic plague that uh, struck Europe in the 1300s, um, that was worse in terms of uh, the proportion of the population that was killed. Um, it wiped out 30% to 50% of Europe's population at the time. Um, but the 1918 flu, um, while it didn't hit the same proportion, um, it was it had a greater uh, you know overall number, and so it, it killed a, a greater number of people in total. Um, in the U.S., approximately 30 million people were infected. Uh, again, roughly one third of the population here, a little bit less. It's like 28%. Um, and we think that about 650,000 to 675,000 roughly um, people in the U.S. died from that. Um, these numbers are, are a little bit more certain than the, the, the worldwide figures uh, because public health reporting uh, here was at least a little bit better than it was in many other places in the world at the time. Um, so it was a, a very big event. Um, and you know, one more kind of very sad way of, of putting it uh, is, to, is to recognize that 675,000 Americans is actually more Americans than have died in every war since the world, since World War I. So World War I, World War II, plus Korea, plus Vietnam, all the way up to today, um, that number does not exceed 675,000. So more people, um, very large number of people die. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So I, you know, I mentioned that the uh, influenza pandemic struck in three waves. Uh, this is a nice, simple visualization of the relative magnitude of, of each of those waves uh, here in the U.S. in terms of uh, deaths. Uh, wave one, which is roughly say March of 1918 to May of 1918, that was actually the least deadly, um, and it was followed by a little bit of a lull as we entered summer. Wave two there in the middle, that's roughly from September to December 1918. Um, that was by far the most deadly. And then uh, wave three, which, uh, which, which came back in, in January to, to roughly June, that was roughly in the middle uh, in terms of uh, severity. Um, and there are explanations why we sort of see these shapes and, and maybe we can touch on some of those as we go. Next slide, please. 
Great. So um, the first wave of uh, pandemic influenza um, occurs in spring of 1918. And the virus probably came from a spillover event in which it jumped from an animal to a human. Uh, some geneticists uh, think it was probably an avian flu, uh, so a, a type of bird flu, type A. Um, but it could have been a, a swine flu or possibly another uh, kind of mammalian kind of flu. Um, we know that seven of the eight gene segments were avian in nature, but the eighth one was uh, mammalian. So um, there's, not some cert there, there's not total certainty there. Um, and, and if anybody's a, you know, in scientists in the crowd, if this is an H1N1 type, uh, in case you're wondering. Um, we don't know exactly where the spillover event uh, happened or in some sense where even the, the infections really started, uh, but there are, there are some multiple theories out there. Um, one theory of origin um, and kind of a most, possibly the most popular theory of, of, of origin is uh, one that points to Haskell County in Kansas. Uh, this is here, right here in the U.S. Um, there was a country doctor by the by the name of uh, Loring Miner, and he uh, he reported seeing uh, some cases in a, in a small uh, rural uh, community where he found uh, 18 cases in one day, and, and three of those people died. And for a you know a small kind of you know, isolated rural community, this was this was very unusual, and, and it caught his attention. He wrote it up in a in a report, um, and this is this is a plausible start starting point um, because the next big place that we know where the flu uh, showed up for sure was Camp Funston at uh, Fort Riley in Kansas. Funston was the, um, the largest uh, army camp um, and training facility for the U.S. Um, they trained 50,000 troops at a time and they were constantly shipping soldiers overseas. Um, young men from those farming communities nearby certainly would have uh, would have you know, we're being called to, to, to report to duty and training uh, there. And so there's, there's definitely a, a possible pathway there. Um, over 1,100 cases occurred there at Camp Funston in the spring of 1918. Um, and there are 46 of those soldiers died, which is actually, a, it's a 4% uh, case fatality rate. So which is higher than uh, what we would expect for, for regular flu. Um, so it caught people's eyes. Um, the Kansas uh, theory is uh, generally that it, 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 the outbreak starts there and then it gets, gets some momentum, but really that it gets exported uh, pretty quickly out of the United States and that, so that the, the first wave here in the U.S. is actually not that noticeable. Um, the first wave here in the U.S. actually, and worldwide, actually ends up being only a little bit worse than the regular seasonal flu, and it's, and it's really not the kind of thing, uh, it's, it's, it's not the flu event that, that really grips the nation the, the way that the second wave does. Some uh, places do have outbreaks. You know, New York City had a, a small outbreak. Uh, Chicago had an outbreak in, 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 the, in the first wave. Um, but again, they were, they were not at quite as noticeable. So that's the Kansas uh, theory of origin. Uh, there are other theories, they, you know, including France, uh, French, Indochina. Uh, there's a Chinese uh, theory as well. Um, I won't go into these except to say that the, the, the China theory is, is the newest one and it's starting to look the strongest, um, but proving these things takes time and, and a lot of research. Um, the first wave is, is relatively small, as I said, but the, the virus does get around. Um, we're still in World War I at this, at this time, and that means uh, that we're, we're concentrating people in, into small army barracks and naval ships. Uh, it means that we're transporting people around the world a lot. Uh, one more thing about um, wave one, uh, around mid-May um, in 1918, the virus uh, starts to acquire the unfortunate name of Spanish flu. Um, you, you may have heard that, uh, that, that this is inaccurate and, and um, that is, that's true, it's inaccurate. Um, this, the only reason that it came to be known as Spanish flu was because Spain was one of the few countries uh, in which the press uh, could could freely report on on bad news, really, um, and so uh, you know, a, a Madrid uh, newspaper called El Sol uh, started reporting on it in, in May of, of 1918. Um, Spain was one of the few neutral countries during war, World War One. Um, everyone else had wartime censors, and those censors would suppress news about the flu um, and other, actually, any other negative bad news um, because they, they thought it would affect uh, morale negatively. It also probably didn't help that uh, Spanish King 
Alfonso uh, came down with it at right around the same time. Uh, so unfortunate for them, it uh, it earned the nickname uh, Spanish flu. Um, and by the way, the um, the Spanish actually thought they got it from the French. So guess what they called it? The, the French flu. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so on to the second wave. Um, and here's where we'll really shift the focus from the, uh, the world stage and the national stage to what was happening specifically in Boston and Massachusetts. And this is also where we can bring Coolidge more into the picture. Um, so during wave one, uh, Boston and Massachusetts, they, they did relatively fine. There was no large outbreak. But in, in wave two, the exact opposite occurred. Uh, in fact, Boston was in some sense the sort of ground zero for the second wave. Um, influenza arrived in Boston in, in August of 1918. Uh, historians believe that it came through the Commonwealth Pier, uh, carried by a relatively small number of infected sailors, possibly returning from, well, like certainly returning from uh, the European theater. theater. Um, this was noticed by the military, and they did some quarantining um, right there at the port in Boston. But what we think happened is that probably an officer broke quarantine and traveled inland to Camp Devons, uh, which is about 40 miles west of uh, Boston. And just like in Camp Funston in Kansas, um, this is another uh, big army camp, and, uh, and it's where things really take off. Um, over the next few weeks, uh, from August 1918 into September 1918, uh, there are 15,000 cases in, uh, at, at Camp Devens, um, and that's out of a total camp population of 45,000. So again, one third of the population roughly uh, acquiring this. Um, and there were, all told, there were over 800 deaths, so very deadly. Um, this is one of the earliest places in the U.S. where uh, Americans really feel that um, kind of emergency pandemic uh, experience, um, that, that experience of things being scary and, and, and out of control. Um, the camp hospital was absolutely overloaded. Um, it was designed for with a capacity of about 1,200 beds, but at the, at the peak, they needed uh, 6,000 uh, beds. They, they needed to take care of 6,000 people at, uh, at one time. Um, so they did not have the space. Uh, they were cramming soldiers together. Uh, newly sick soldiers just kept coming in each day. Um, after the morgue uh, filled up, they, they were stacking bodies in the hallways. It was a, it was a very gruesome uh, situation. It was a, a definite concern that this would pass into the civilian population in Massachusetts, and, and sure enough, it did. Um, and this probably happened in two ways. Uh, first, from possibly from civilian family members who were going into Camp Devons to, to help care for the, the loved ones. Remember, they were overloaded. They needed the help. Uh, and then secondly, from a, uh, there was a, a parade. There was a, a Win the War for Freedom parade that was held in Boston in early September, um, September 2nd. And, and that parade involved uh, several thousand uh, people uh, mostly military personnel and government workers in, in the shipbuilding uh, industry, and they were marching right through the city and, and mingling with, uh, with civilians. Um, anticipating the spread uh, in early September, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, namely John Hitchcock, uh, asked newspapers to start publishing information on what people could do to avoid the flu. So uh, classic, you know, public health communication as a first step there, which was, which was good. Um, the first civilian cases were, were, were reported uh, on or about September 11th of 1918. Um, people turned up at hospitals in increasing numbers, um, and some of these hospitals ended up getting overloaded. Uh, and this is where state leaders stepped in, including Lieutenant Governor Calvin Coolidge. Um, as I'm sure this audience is aware, Coolidge was Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts at this time. The governor was uh, Samuel McCall. So what was the response from state leaders? At first, they, they monitored things. Uh, then after a couple of weeks, uh, this first civilian, uh, or a couple of weeks after the first civilian case, 
Uh, the city of Austin started closing schools. Um, they also closed businesses such as movie theaters and dance halls, uh, uh, pool halls, and other sort of quote places of amusement. Um, as far as I can tell, the, the closures did not apply to all businesses uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, and certainly none, nothing that would have been for the war effort would have been shut down. Um, but uh, they did have some of those shutdowns. Uh, CC, if you could advance uh, two clicks, I think, for a new picture. Perfect. All right. Um, so right after the city announced the closures, um, which was September 26th, um, we got uh, calls for help uh, in terms of medical personnel. Uh, and this is something that Clue himself uh, had in there. Uh, the call was traveling in Canada at the time, so Coolidge and, and Lieutenant Governor sent out, or so Coolidge, at, acting as the Lieutenant Governor, uh, sent out telegrams to other leaders from uh, and officials from other states, um, asking for doctors and nurses to be uh, sent from surrounding states uh, to Massachusetts to help. Um, Massachusetts did get some help that way, although not all states um, that they asked actually even had help to give. Uh, for instance, we know that Vermont Governor Horace Graham uh, responded to Coolidge um, saying that they would, they would give Coolidge's request some publicity, uh, but because Vermont uh, was also desperate for, for doctors and nurses, they, they, they really couldn't guarantee anything. That, and they weren't sure how many people would, would keep the call. Um, in Vermont at the time, they were, they were even pressing their um, uh, UVM uh, medical students into, into field service. The, uh, the governor's office also put out a, a general purpose proclamation uh, aimed at increasing um, health system capacity. Um, that proclamation was signed by Coolidge, and, and uh, I'll, I'll read a sentence from it. Um, it said, quote, it is earnestly requested that everyone who has had medical or nursing experience or who can assist in any way communicate with the commissioner of the health, uh, commissioner of health at the state house. Um, so they were concerned with health system capacity too, just as, just as we are today with coronavirus. Um, that brings us to the end of September. And at this point, over 50,000 people in Massachusetts had the flu. Uh, that's that's out of a population of about 3.7 million, uh, so more than one percent uh, infected at this at this time. Moving on into October, um, it, we have additional closure closures and cancellations. Uh, those continue be, to be issued. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts was closed. Boston Public Library was closed. Uh, more schools were closed. Soda fountains, barber shops, all closed. Um, as for churches, I've read that um, uh, many of the Protestant churches were closed, but some of the Catholic churches still held masses. I'm, I'm guessing that statewide there would have been a mix of some open and, and some not. Um, and one other thing, um, this, this also happened to be an election year, so uh, many political rallies were canceled. Um, the Republican Party's own state convention was canceled, and... Um, and that was relevant to Coolidge because he was in the middle of running for governor that year. Um, Coolidge uh, actually even touches on this uh, very briefly in his autobiography. Okay, CC, two more uh, clicks for the next picture. Great. There was a uh, big volunteer effort. Uh, medical students and nursing students all helped out. The Red Cross uh, recruited local volunteers as, as well as volunteers from as far away as Canada. Um, they came together to, uh, to make masks for doctors and nurses. That's what you see in that picture right there. Um, they also delivered food to, uh, to people who were too frightened to leave home. So, okay, so um, how did the outbreak end then in, in Massachusetts at least? Well, despite the sharp peak, um, and in, in Boston, at one point, that meant 150 deaths per day. Um, the worst of it only lasted about four to six weeks from mid-September to the, the, the very end of October, arguably into a little bit into November as well. Um, in terms of a metric or, or like a goal that they were using to uh, determine when it was safe to reopen businesses, uh, Mayor Andrew Peters of Boston, he, he was looking at 
the number of uh, daily deaths, and he was, he was waiting for the, the number of daily deaths in Boston to fall below 100 for multiple days in a row, uh, technically for twice in three days is, is what they were looking for. And of course, eventually it did uh, by, by the end of October and early November. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it, it had taken its toll. Um, all told, about 20,000 people died in Massachusetts. Um, after the peak, uh, the, the, the number of cases in Massachusetts declined fairly steadily. There was a, a small resurgence around Thanksgiving when people went out and attended some Thanksgiving Day parades that were held. There was also another small um, resurgence around uh, Christmas when people got together with the families for the, the holiday. Uh, but for Massachusetts, really the, the worst of, of, that, um, of that wave was over by the uh, by, by er, end of October and early November. Uh, just to, to close on this wave here, uh, in Massachusetts, the you know, political life went on. Um, for Coolidge, gubernatorial elections were held uh, on their scheduled day, so that, that was November 4th, 1918, um, and, and Coolidge won. Uh, so he won the governorship 51% uh, to 47%, which was actually a close race. Okay, on to the third wave. Great. So the um, the second wave ended in December 1918, at least from the, the North American perspective. Um, but then a third wave uh, got underway in Australia uh, in, in, in January of 1919. Um, and after circulating for a little bit of time there, it was actually brought back to, the, to, to Europe and uh, in the United States. Um, this wave was just as lethal as the other waves in terms of mortality rate, but in total, this wave didn't kill as many as this, uh, as the second wave, um, it's probably because the, the transmission rate uh, was was lower with uh, with, you know, with the war being over and um, and soldiers having been discharged and sent home. Armistice Day was uh, November back in November, November 11th, 1918. So we're we're past that now. War is over. Um, the world, you know, just no longer had the crowding of troops and tight living spaces in the same way, nor the constant uh, transporting of people uh, from place to place. Uh, for the third wave in the U.S., some of the cities that were hit uh, hardest were, were Los Angeles. Uh, New York City had a, uh, an outbreak. San Francisco, um, St. Louis, and, and Nashville were all, all hit as well. Um, Boston had some cases in the third wave, but it, it, it certainly wasn't hit as bad uh, as, as, as it had been earlier. Um, Coolidge, by the way, was inaugurated governor of Massachusetts on January 2nd. So he oversaw this period. Um, there are some open mysteries about the third wave. Uh, you might have you might have expected the third wave to be maybe the weakest of them all, but you know why is it kind of in the middle? Um, part of the reason uh, why the third wave uh, infected and, and killed as many people as it did is possibly because it might have been a slightly mutated virus. Um, we we know. Uh, we think we know that the, the first and second waves were probably the same virus. Uh, they, they killed the same demographic, young adults, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a little bit. Um, and also exposure uh, to, the, to the first wave was highly protective against the second wave, but exposure to the first or second waves was not protective um, against the third wave. So that makes us you know, wonder um, whether there was antigenic drift, uh, which is basically a the, the name for a small mutation that, uh, that, that changes the surface proteins of the virus and, and, and the surface proteins are, are, are what matter because that's what your, your body uses to, to recognize those. Um, and that's, what, uh, that's how you, you have an immune, a functioning immune, immunity to, to this. Um, and then just as an aside in, in this wave uh, too, um, you know, it's, it's believed that President Woodrow Wilson actually contracted the virus during uh, uh, the, the World War I peace negotiations in Paris in April of 1919. So that's sort of a, a, a few quick things about the, uh, the third wave. We should, um, we can go on to the, the next slide, which is the, the aftermath. Great. So as the pandemic started to uh, kind of wind down in the middle part of 1919, 
um, there was a definite fraying of, I'd say, social trust in institutions um, to the extent that the handling of the influenza outbreaks uh, con contributed to this. It, I, I think it probably came from the realization that the, the press and many political leaders uh, had conspired to withhold information from the public about what was really going on. Um, and, and the thing is, when, when people can't trust what's in the newspapers, you get the rumor mill, uh, and that tends to make people even more frightened, not less frightened. Beyond influenza, though, be, you know, beyond the effects of, of, of the pandemic, um, also just you know, economic conditions had deteriorated. Food prices had more than doubled since from, from 1915 to 1920. Uh, clothing costs had more than tripled. Um, in many cities, laborers were on edge. There was a general strike in Seattle. There was a, a major steel strike in Chicago uh, at this time. Um, Chicago had a riot. St. Louis had a riot. Um, internationally, there was, uh, there was, there was fears of Bolshevism. Um, communists uh, seized power in Hungary for a few short months in 1919, uh, and, and there were also worker revolts in, in Italy and Germany, among other places. So um, this sort of all leads up uh, to September 1919. Um, to bring it back to Gabriel Coolidge again, uh, he was um, he was able to uh, he was he was probably put to his his greatest political test uh, at least up until that point um which was a a strike of the boston police um the police had demanded a uh, a pay raise um and that demand was rejected um and so they went on strike and, and and coolidge famously did not capitulate um declaring that uh quote there's no right to strike against the public safety by anybody anywhere anytime end quote and so that that action showed that he was a strong supporter of law and order, which was uh, probably what the country needed at that time. Um, and arguably that uh, action uh, sealed his, his nomination for the vice president uh, nomination um, next year on the 1920 uh, ticket. So that's sort of like the 1919 aftermath there. Um, let's move on to the takeaways. This is the last uh, slide. Okay, so you know, I'm sure sure people are kind of curious to know, uh, you know, what can this tell us about how we should deal with SARS-CoV-2? Uh, what lessons can we learn? Um, certainly, want to be careful about wading too far into policy recommendations in this talk, um, but I think we I think we can at least highlight some of the areas that make our situation similar, and some, maybe some of the areas that make our situation different. Um, first off, uh, some of the things that are similar. Uh, one, I think we can maybe agree that uh, transparency and truth are, are, are very important. Um, I didn't fully prove this whole thing to you in the talk because we just focused on one city and, and, and actually Boston was, was pretty good on, on this front. But if you look at other cities and do comparisons, what you, what you do see is that when, um, when, when newspapers suppressed information about the, the outbreak or, or downplayed its seriousness, um, in some cases by lying, saying that it's just the regular flu, um, or, or promoting a, a don't worry kind of um, uh, message, it tended to backfire. Um, and so I think uh, you know, both then and now we see that you know, truth and, and transparency are important. Uh, number two, with regard to closures, um, I think closing down, uh, uh, I think closing schools and, and some business establishments uh, definitely helped them uh, in terms of reducing uh, exposures in 1918. Um, that said, they, they did approach it a little bit differently. They, they didn't make decisions about closings necessarily so far out into the future uh, as, as we've been doing. So there's a little bit of a difference there about, about how we uh, approach that versus them. Um, they did close schools and businesses, but then basically as soon as they felt it was safe enough, um, and, and really you can never be perfectly risk-free, but uh, you know, once they felt it was safe enough, they reopened them. They, they didn't have closures already scheduled out weeks beyond that. Um, and so the, and another thing is that they were also less, seemed to be less statewide about it. As far as I could determine uh, in, in, in researching this, um, closings were, were largely made on a more of a city by city basis and town by town. For number three, uh, health system capacity. You know, we saw that they needed extra doctors and extra nurses just as 
Uh, we've needed that in our situation. Governor McCall and Lieutenant Governor Coolidge, um, they asked for help mainly from other states. Um, they did ask help from Washington too, um, but the federal government, you know, with so much of the focus being on the war, um, federal government did very little uh, other than allocating a, a $1 million uh, allotment for the U.S. Public Health Service for, for response. There wasn't actually any, uh, there wasn't any research uh, funding in there. It was, it was all kind of immediate response funding. Um, I'm not sure how much, uh, you know, McCall and, and Coolidge actually expected from the federal government. Um, it may have been more about them kind of sounding the alarm. Um, but in any case, you know, system ca capacity was a, a challenge for them just as it is for us. Number four, um, I didn't talk about a, a, a lot because it was only kind of a minor issue in Boston, but at least in other cities, there was a major debate over the masks, um, you know, whether they actually helped. Um, in, in cities in, out west, in particular, San Francisco really took this seriously. Um, they made it a, a requirement that you uh, wear a mask in, when you're out in public, and, and they, would, they would arrest people for not wearing it. Um, and we're still sort of having that same debate today. Um, you know, I think today we, we, we understand a little bit more that it, it sort of comes down to how well somebody can tolerate a mask. And if you can wear it well, and not be touching yourself all the time and, and adjusting it and everything, then there probably is some small benefit. And, and also that it protects, uh, it protects other people, not necessarily you. Um, whereas they, they, they didn't really have a, a, a lot of that nuance in for their, their understanding. Uh, going on to things that are different, um, you know, we, we definitely get around more and we get around more quickly uh, today than, than they did. So we have more opportunities for exposure and, and more far-reaching opportunities for exposure to, to worry about. Um, our information also moves faster, uh, but because of you know, reduced travel times, we, we, we actually have less time to react in some ways. Um, you know, when we hear about a, a, an outbreak happening someplace, uh, it might already be on its way to our community, right? Could, all, could possibly be too late. Uh, so that, that tends to actually work against us in our, you know, in our modern uh, society. Um, on positive side, we're not facing wartime conditions, uh, so we don't have that kind of crowding and, uh, and those sorts of things that were associated with, with, with the war, uh, whereas they did have to contend with that. Uh, number two, on the, on the differences, um, you know, who the virus hits the hardest, this is a big difference. Uh, Spanish influenza and coronavirus are very different. Um, the flu was mostly, uh, or was most deadly for, for young, uh, young adults ages 20 to 40. Um, and the reason why is that um, the way in which it tended to kill is that it, it triggered a massive immune response um, in your lungs and in, in your mucosal membranes. And that, at least in the worst cases, you, you know, many times you would, you would actually die from your own reaction to the virus. Because uh, it, it would trigger such a strong immune response, um, people died from their their lungs filling up with fluid. Um, often they would contract secondary bacterial pneumonia. And they didn't have uh, yeah, biotics. Um, you know, why young adults in this regard? It, that's because people from 20 to 40 years old are the people who have the strongest immune systems. Um, the virus also struck uh, extremely quickly. Um, People were sometimes dead within 24 hours of, of, uh, of contracting it, um, whereas coronavirus as we know, is not like that. And in fact, um, one of the dangers of coronavirus is that it has a longer incubation, incubation period, so about four to six days. Uh, so one of the things I'm not working on in our favor is that uh, you could be an asymptomatic carrier and, uh, and infect other people without even knowing it. Um, so, uh, and then of course, we all, you know, as we all know, um, coronavirus tends to hit uh, older adults, partners, people with um, less strong immune systems. For treatment, um, I actually wasn't sure whether to put this one as uh, similar or different. Um, in one sense, uh, obviously we can do much more in the clinical setting uh, than they could. Um, we, ha we have ventilators and we have antibiotics to, to, to fight off the, the pneumonia that you might get from it. Of course, antibiotics don't do anything to the virus, but they, they can help with the secondary um, pneumonia, that's what uh, we develop. Um, but at the same time, we don't, uh, 
So we don't have antiviral drugs for this uh, yet. Um, our approach is, is really based on helping patients kind of stay alive long enough for their own immune systems to fight off the disease. Um, we might get there with antivirals, um, and we might also get a vaccine too, but uh, there, um, but the you know, vaccine could be very, very long time away if, if it comes at all. So we're working hard on it, but uh, there could be a, a quite a delay. And fourth, um, finally, uh, testing. We'll just throw this in there. Uh, they obviously didn't have testing. We do. Uh, they made diagnoses based on observation of symptoms. Um, our ability to test to be a couple. Um, it could be a changer, but um, really to make the most of the advantage of that pandemic, uh, we're, you know, we're going to be better at testing. We need to be able to do more tests more quickly and, and, and have them be more accurate as well. Um, so that, those are some of the, the takeaways sort of organized as like what's similar and what's different. Um, and that actually also wraps up what I wanted to, to, uh, to talk about today with, uh, with regard to Calvin Coolidge and the 1918 uh, quote. Um, so thank you very much. And I guess we have some questions. Awesome. Jared, thank awesome. you so much for that. Um, presentation that was very very interesting and judging by the quantity of questions that are coming in right now I am not the only one who is overwhelmed by the similarities between 1918 and 2020. Um, so our first question um, is coming in it came in via email from Margot um, and I think you touched on this a little bit um, why were young men more predisposed to succumbing to the Spanish flu versus the current COVID-19 yeah this is that immune uh, system response uh, thing again so um, you know what what this what the virus does is it's, it sets off your immune system and if, if you have a really strong immune system which 20 to 40 year olds do um, that's what you that's what you actually uh, suffer from it's it's the uh, it's the the immense um, uh, response in your lungs in your mucosal membranes like I said um, that uh, fill up the fluid it be, it becomes that that's the thing that you end up uh, uh, end up fighting um, if that gets infected uh, if your lungs get infected that way um, you uh, then you're then you're talking about pneumonia setting in um, there was a one sort of maybe gruesome thing to um, to, to touch on with, with regard to that is that you, know, you, you have you have these these young people with their lungs filling up, um, and you have you know strong people. They're coughing. These, these soldiers were coughing so hard. Um, you know, specifically talking about the, the the soldiers in the camps that were coming down with it. They're coughing so hard that they're actually creating these micro tears in their lungs, and then air. Uh, you have these air pockets happening, and people. Uh, nurses report saying that you know when when these soldiers would move and, and turn over in their beds and stuff, they would they would have this audible crunching sound and and they, it's it's been compared to like Rice Krispies and the sound of that happening. It's very very gruesome, but you know this is the reality of it. Um, so that's uh, yeah that's it, it's it's a bad demographic because of their their immune um, response. Um, another question that we got um, from several people, um, sort of in different iterations, how did people follow the rules then versus now when things were closed, when masks were required? I know that that was a, a bit of a debate back then. Um, were they followed? How did people get outdoors? Um, and sort of how did people respond to the rules that were put in place? Yeah, I don't have a great survey on that. Um, one of the problems with the press sort of uh, not reporting on this is that you, when you go back and try to look at the record at this, it, it's not that the papers are, are full of stuff to look at exactly. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you almost would have had to have been there to, to know much about that. Um, I can tell you that it, it, it definitely varied from city to city. It, you know, we did not have in Boston, uh, we didn't have quite the same kind of uh, problems that they did um, in, in other cities. Um, in, in San Francisco, I mentioned San Francisco had really taking the mask thing seriously and, 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 um, and, and having laws against um, you know, kissing in public and spitting in public and these, these kinds of things that uh, you know, seem I don't know, old, 
old to us now. Big Talking was was uh, a, a uh, was specifically named as a thing. I, I presume that means like maybe getting up on a on a soapbox or or a a gazebo or something and, and rousing up a crowd. You know that that kind of thing was um, was was actually uh, made illegal um, in certain cities. Um, so. That's the best I can do in terms of you know how people uh, responded at, at that level to you know at the, the everyday kind of you know person walking through the street. Um, there there are reports of, of for instance like children um, playing in their own yards getting uh, you know forcibly told to uh, uh, to, to to go inside. Um, people on street corners. Uh, we uh, they knew that. Um, they knew that it transferred, from, there was a transmission from person to person, they knew it was contagious. They didn't have the same viral understanding of the, of, of the viral nature of it for sure. Um, but they knew that it was contagious and that you wanted to, to stay separated. So there was um, social distancing in, uh, to, to an extent. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's hard to, to, to know exactly. Um, next question comes from Richard Pollack says xenophobia added considerable insult to injury to prior epidemics, such as the 1892 typhus and cholera epidemics in New York City, as well as the current COVID-19 pandemic. To what extent was the 1918-1919 influenza outbreak accompanied by such racial and national overtones? I don't know that I have a lot of information to share on that one. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know that I know much about that in, in particular. It's a good question, though. Um, and certainly, you know, we want to be careful uh, these days uh, knowing where, you know, even just how we refer to this uh, for coronavirus. Um, there is, I mean, there is a long um, history in, uh, in, in, in medicine of, of naming a virus, for instance, after after where it, you discover it, you know, I mean, that, that happens all the time. There's lots of examples of that. Even Ebola is, is named after the Ebola River. Um, West Nile, you know, lots of things like that. Um, if, if that's, um, if that's uh, uh, sort of the thought behind that, um, you know, there's, I, I don't know that the Spanish flu uh, naming of the virus was uh, necessarily uh, motivated in the same way. I think that was, again, that was, that was the, the, the press issue and, and people having no other place to to um, to, to, to place this, um, and that's kind of how that came about. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, our next question sort of brings us back to Calvin Coolidge a bit. Um, this is from uh, our one of our Coolidge volunteer scribes, um, Alvino Mario Fantini, um, and he writes without getting into specific policy details. Are there any materials or research that indicate what Coolidge thought might be an appropriate public sector response to a pandemic, either a coordinated vigorous federal response or respectful deference to the choices of individual states? Uh, I, you're going to force me to speculate a little bit there, um, because uh, it's not like he uh, published any, um, uh, you know, extensively on this or even much at all. Uh, I, I looked through his uh, speeches from 1918. Uh, you know, he made several speeches, but they were all about the war. Um, and uh, they, you know, he, he doesn't mention the flu. I, I looked through even his presidential speeches thinking, oh, maybe he, you know, said something about it retrospectively or something. He never mentioned the, the influenza in any of those speeches. Um, so he is, you know, he's not, uh, he has not published on this. Um, I suspect he'd be, uh, wanting to see uh, a, a more of a decentralized response. I, I think he'd want to see people have at least, um, I think he wanted to see people have the, the knowledge and the, the, the best information available so that they can make their, their, their wisest uh, choices. Um, I think there'd be some care there to, uh, at, at least at first when you don't know what you're dealing with, to, to, to lock down things. It's very prudent and sensible to to you know, close some schools for a while while you figure out what you're dealing with, um, but uh, you know, over time, um, uh, you know, how would he deal? You know, he he, he used his particular uh, position to to ask for for help from other states. I think that you know the, the fact that they 
emphasize that as opposed to going too much to the federal government, I think tells us something about his um, uh, a view of, of, of who should be responding. Um, and then certainly, you know, later in, in his career when he's in, in president and, and he's, he has to respond to emergencies, um, he, you know, he doesn't show the kind of like favoritism that, uh, you know, of, of the federal government responding to, to large, um, you know, whether it's a flood or things like that. He, um, you know, he expects local, more local, um, uh, which could be state or, or city uh, level uh, responses to, to those kinds of uh, troubles. Great. All right. And I think this might be um, looking like it might be one of our final questions. So if you have any sure. um, final thoughts on um, which areas in Boston were hardest hit, if you know. Um, our uh, person asking our question on well, only an email address. Um, it says, I've read, for example, that the North End was overcrowded during this time period. Was it particularly hard hit? And then a follow-up question from the same um, individual was, on whom did Coolidge and McCall rely for medical and policy advice during this time? Good, yeah, I'll, I'll try to tackle those two quickly. The first one um, is that uh, I, I actually haven't seen a lot that, that splits up Boston into its uh, neighborhoods and, and, and um, you know, kind of ranks how bad things were there. What I can say, if, if it's of help and of interest, um, in terms of other towns in Massachusetts, you know, Salem had a, a, a pretty bad outbreak. Lynn had an outbreak. Gloucester had an outbreak. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, so I know how to say that. Um, those are some of the towns that, um, uh, you know, also in addition to Boston, you know, face face some troubles. Um, the other question was, uh, what was the other question? Um, the other question was on whom did um, McCall oh, yes. Coolidge rely for advice? Right, right. So it was um, the, the Massachusetts Department of Health uh, leader there, which is John Hitchcock. Um, there was, and, and there were there were a few people in those um, in those uh, you know departments of health. There, there was a, a committee of emergency response, or I, I forget the name of that committee, but there was a couple of different bodies that were staffed by um, by doctors and and people in public health service. Um, and uh, Coolidge um, and McCall uh, definitely deferred to them. Uh, we don't know, you know, all the behind the scenes kinds of things, but the fact that Coolidge didn't, um, Coolidge and McCall didn't necessarily have, have their name on all of these, uh, you know, orders and proclamations and everything, it suggests to me that um, they might have been involved in helping to, you know, make those decisions, but, um, but again, sort of deferred some of the, um, uh, the, the, the role and the responsibility so that these other people could um, uh, uh, be the, the, the public um, kind of spokesperson for that. I actually think that's really important because, um, you know, your, your Department of Health person is not going to be a political appointee. And at this point, when people really need to uh, kind of trust what they're hearing, it's probably better for that message to be a Position or you know a, a spokesperson who's not an elected official because even if it's a really popular elected official, and Coolidge is a pretty popular person, you know, pretty well liked, but even 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 for him, there's going to be you know like I said, 47 percent of the people voted for someone else, right? Um, so I think it's I think it's best uh, for for some of these things uh, at least to be to be uh, handed down I guess by um, uh, non-elected uh, politicians uh, by, by by people in positions of uh, you know, public health and uh, um, in, in hospitals. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Jared. This has been such an interesting um, way to spend our afternoon. It's been so informative, and I'm sure if everyone wasn't muted, they would uh, loudly agree with me. Um, and a, a warm round of applause for Jared. Um, yes, thank you okay, so well, much. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's, it's been fun to do. and. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, and fascinating topic. I wish there was more written about it, you know, to, uh, but it's, um, it's been fun. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm Cece with the Coolidge Foundation. That's Jared. We have uh, most of the rest of our small team has been on the call with us today. 
Um, we believe that Calvin Coolidge really is important and can be an inspiration to um, understanding our, president, our present and preparing for our future. Um, if you agree, you're welcome to join us in some of our efforts that we have going on. And I'll just highlight um, a few that I mentioned at the beginning as well. Um, we have a scribe program where you can help us build up our digital library. Right now we're transcribing speeches and press conferences that President Coolidge gave. He was silent, but not so silent. Um, and so there's lots of his um, words to be put online and transcribed. We're looking for volunteers to help us with that effort. So if you're interested, let me know. Um, we're also accepting donations through a GoFundMe page to um, fund our digital library. So if you'd prefer to contribute in that way, um, we would certainly appreciate it. Um, and this has been our second digital event. Our third will be taking place later this week. Um, and that will be this Thursday at noon. Our chairman and best-selling author, Amity Schles, will be speaking on whether Coolidge caused the Great Depression. Um, and so that is going to be a very fascinating conversation, and I hope that you will all join us for that. For login details, um, please email me just as you did to get access to today. And thank you all again so much for joining us.